Hey there, nerds. Welcome back to part five of our Martian geography series. We've already touched on Mars's massive mountains and colossal canyons, the highlands and the lowlands, the poles and more. We've explored some terraforming ideas, and we've talked about Mars's thin atmosphere and its lack of magnetosphere. Today, we're going to be diving into Martian clouds and Mars's two moons. At the end, we'll get into a fun hypothetical. If humans do manage to colonize Mars, how would we evolve over time? If you've read or watched The Expanse before, you'll probably have some idea of what I'm talking about, as the Earthlings, Martians, and Belters all ended up evolving differently and having their own unique desires, which led to a lot of strife and hardship and even war between Earth and Mars. Before we dive into all of that wild stuff, let's talk about some facts first and learn more about the Red Planet's phenomenal features. I realize at this point we aren't just talking about geography. The scope has expanded quite a bit to cover everything from craters to clouds to hypothetical Martian war crimes, so let's just roll with it. I would assume many of you were like clouds on Mars, seriously? I mean, most people think of Mars as a dusty, bone-dry wasteland with thin air and no weather. You'd be surprised to find out that Mars does actually have clouds, some of which are huge, ghostly formations that seem to appear and disappear like a thief in the night. The most famous of these is the Arcea Mons Elongated Cloud, or the AMEC, it's a 500 kilometer long cloud that can be seen from space, and it forms near our Sea Mons. So you'll remember this as one of the three other massive mountains in the Tharsis region, next to the Olympus Mons. The AMEC isn't a permanent fixture. It only shows up during the Southern Hemisphere's spring and summer, reforming and dissipating daily over the course of several months. It's actually made of water ice, not the carbon dioxide clouds that one would expect on Mars. But that's not even the crazy part. The really wild part is how it forms. Winds rushing up the slopes of the volcano cause the moisture in the thin air to condense, forming a dramatic wispy streamer that extends into the sky before slowly vanishing. So if you've seen lenticular clouds that hover over the mountains on Earth, it's a very similar phenomena, but the AMEC stretches much further. This is because Mars has lower atmospheric pressure and weaker gravity, which allows the cloud to grow larger and persist for hours before going away. Besides that, Mars also lacks strong weather systems to break it up, so it kind of just keeps on stretching on forever until it dissipates. In general, Martian clouds are far different from Earth's, so since the atmosphere is so thin, uh, less than 1% of Earth's, clouds form at way higher altitudes, around 50 to 80 kilometers up. So for comparison, Earth's generally form between 2 to 18 kilometers, depending on the type of cloud. And with that in mind, there are a few other notable clouds on Mars. I'm not going to go into super deep detail on these, but if you have any questions, let me know in the comments and I'll answer you or I'll whip up a quick video if it's too complex to answer quickly. And since I'm mentioning that, make sure to let me know how I'm doing. Share and subscribe to the channel and help me out on my mission of making the internet a smarter place. I do read and respond to all the comments personally as I run this entire channel by myself. So welcome back to Cloud Computing 101. Today's lesson, actual clouds. <laughs> Uh, okay, polar hood clouds. During the winter, both of the poles develop large planet-wide cloud systems called polar hoods. They're made of carbon dioxide and water ice, forming a dense hazy layer over the poles. Number two, mooring water ice clouds. Some regions, especially near the Tharsis volcanoes, experience persistent morning clouds made of water ice. They form due to temperature differences between the surface and the atmosphere, and they usually burn off by midday. And there are also high altitude CO2 clouds, as I mentioned a bit earlier. These clouds are ultra high, kind of like our cirrus clouds on Earth, but way, way higher up at up to 80 kilometers. So they're very rare on Earth, but they seem to be very common on Mars due to its frigid upper atmosphere during certain conditions. While the AMAC is the most dramatic, Mars's wafer thin atmosphere still manages to produce an interesting variety of cloud formations just not nearly as frequently or as thick as Earth's. So next, let's talk about Mars's two weird little moons, Phobos and Deimos. These tiny little misshapen chunks of rock were probably captured asteroids from the asteroid belt. Phobos is the larger of the two at about 22 kilometers or 14 miles across. It's about as long as Manhattan or Paris, and Deimos is just a puny 12 kilometers across which is comparable to the size of just the Chicago Loop, that little section of 294 that makes a beltway around the inner part of the city. 
Phobos orbits extremely close to Mars at about 6,000 kilometers over the surface. So it actually rises in the west and it sets in the east, zipping across the sky in just a few hours. Uh, because of this close proximity, its fate is already sealed. It'll either collide with Mars or be shredded by tidal forces, in which case Mars may get a ring for a while. But don't worry, this isn't happening anytime soon, just as most things in outer space typically don't. So SpaceX's first crews shouldn't really have to worry about that, but they'll have enough on their plate, especially if Elon doesn't develop a nice little moon colony first. Deimos is further out with a slower orbit, and it takes about 30 hours for it to orbit Mars, so it's slowly drifting away like our moon is. Neither of those moons would really help us much for bases. Phobos in particular is full of deep grooves. It's covered in a thick layer of regolith that would kick up easily in the low gravity, but they could offer some help for possible future colonies, such as fuel and water extraction, mining for rare metals that could help service colonies without trips back to Earth. They could serve as observation posts or places to put instruments, such as putting an artificial magnetosphere on Phobos, as I discussed in a little bit more detail in part four of this series. Other than that, Mars's moons are pretty much just giant boulders, but they offer some extra help and possibilities for a possible future mission. Now let's get into the fun, wild, and slightly terrifying part. How would humans evolve if we lived on Mars in the long term? Assuming we get past the initial hurdles of colonization, the lower gravity at just 38% of Earth's would start having profound effects on our bodies over generations. First, let's talk height. In Mars's weaker gravity, the human spine would stretch more than on Earth, meaning future Martians could be significantly taller than their Earth-born counterparts, and at the same time, lower gravity means bones wouldn't need to be as dense, potentially making them more fragile. And over generations, we might see Martians becoming lankier, with longer limbs and weaker muscles, a bit like the classic gray alien look. <laughs> so then there's the skin tone. With Mars's thin atmosphere and lack of magnetic field, radiation is a huge problem. To combat this, humans might evolve paler and even translucent skin to maximize vitamin D absorption, while also developing thicker layers of melanin or other protective pigmentation to shield against cosmic rays. Some have even speculated that future Martians might develop enhanced repair mechanisms at the cellular level to deal with the constant radiation exposure. And we've actually seen this on Earth. For example, fungus in the Chernobyl region absorbs radiation and turns it into energy in a process called radiotrophy. There are more examples of this. Let me know if you'd be interested in hearing a longer video about that. Other adaptations could include larger eyes to compensate for the lower light levels, a more efficient cardiovascular system to function with less oxygen, and possible changes in reproduction due to Mars's lower gravity affecting fetal development. So Mars is already a world of mystery and extreme conditions, but as we dream of colonizing it, we have to think about the long-term consequences. The planet's geography, climate, and moons all pose challenges, but they also provide opportunities for settlement. And if we stay long enough, Mars won't just be a new home. It might just forge a new branch of humanity itself. So what do you think? Would you sign up to be a first-generation Martian, knowing that your descendants might end up taller, paler, and at odds with Earth? Let me know in the comments, and as always, like, subscribe, and check out my other videos for more deep dives into the cosmos. And thanks for learning with me today. I'll see you in the next episode. Bye.